Hi everybody, my name is Andy Edwards. I work for a firm of accountants called Thorn Widgery and we're going to be presenting to you on Zero for Education, some financial accounting software that we've helped design specifically for schools but principally academies. Today's webinar is targeted mainly at business managers but don't worry if you're in the education sector it may still be as valuable to you as it will be hopefully to our business managers in the audience and also if you're a head teacher actually you might, uh, might find some value in today's webinar as well. I think to help put this thing into context one of the things I want to talk about is how Zero for Education first came about. Um, I've mentioned that I'm working for Thorn Widgery, we're a firm of chartered accountants in Herefordshire. We're also heavily involved in, in auditing academies and one of the things that became apparent during our process as auditors a lot of business managers were telling us that they were working with clunky old-fashioned financial software that really wasn't really fit for purpose and so as a consequence based on what you told us as business managers and based on our experience of auditors what we have been able to do is configure zero to give a much better, a much more modern, dynamic piece of software to help business managers in their day-to-day -day role. As a consequence, as it so happens, because we're auditors, one of the real benefits is we also understand what we want to see at the back end when we're carrying out an academy audit. And so part of our thinking has also been to configure zero to make the audit process that much smoother. So hopefully you get the best of both worlds. You get a system fit for purpose for business managers, basically helping make life easier for you guys and to save you time. But also at the back end, you get a system that really is going to be helpful to the audit process, helping to streamline that process, helping to save time, and hopefully helping to make the audit less intrusive. Now, some of you might love your week or so with your auditors and some of you might think that that's a good thing. I'll leave that judgment up to you. Another thing that we want to talk about, I mean there are, there are many benefits to Zero, and as we get into the webinar hopefully we'll unearth some of these benefits, but it doesn't matter so much what I think. Um, what we're really here to do as well is to share what we found as a consequence of asking for the feedback from the business managers. And another simple plus point to Zero is the fact that it's cloud-based. Again, we've talked about some of the clunky softwares that have been out there maybe for 5, 10, 15 years, and they're a little bit old-fashioned, they're a little bit unflexible or inflexible. Um, the fact of the matter is, Zero, because it's cloud-based, it means that you can access the system anywhere, providing you have an internet connection. And also it's multi-platform. So in fact, it doesn't have to be on a static PC. You can use a laptop, you can use a phone. Now to scare some of you business managers out there, even head teachers love the fact that it's multi-platform and it's cloud-based. In fact, I was speaking to a head teacher the other day and he said he loves the fact that he can dial into zero every day, even on his mobile, just to see what's going on. So be on your toes, business managers, the head teacher might be watching. But that's another thing we're going to talk about, which is levels of access to the system. But I'm going to be leaving that to my colleagues later. I think one of the other areas I want to bring out as well is, in fact, how easy it is to use Zero, Because I know that change is often a difficult thing to implement in any business. And why should it be any different in yours? And I, I suspect there are a number of you that are thinking, well, I remember how I was trying to get to grips with my original software and how much training I had to have. And, you know, going through that whole learning process in of itself is just a real drain on energy and time. Well, one of the pleasing things about Zero, again, not my words, are the words of some of our business managers in terms of how easy it is just to get to grips with it and get, get to grips with it and how intuitive uh, it is so that you don't need to have a degree in software technology or in IT. Actually, it's fairly straightforward. Again, Poor old business managers, watch out. That was one of the things that the head loves about it as well. Before, it was the murky world of financial software and heads kind of left it all to the business manager. But now the head teachers are saying, do you know what? This is really easy to get to grips with. So much so that I can even share some of the information with my governors at the drop of a hat. And we'll be seeing later in this webinar how that might happen. So that's a very brief introduction to Zero in terms of where it's come from, how it's been developed. 
and some of the key benefits, namely the fact that it's been designed with you in mind, albeit with also auditors at the back end. The fact that it's cloud-based, and so the fact you, you, you can dial in anywhere as long as you have an internet connection. So guess what, business managers? You can have a summer holiday as well now. You can log in either from your kitchen chair or perhaps sitting on your yacht in Monaco or Monte Carlo watching the people go by. And yes, you might think that's a bit far-fetched, but it's absolutely true. We have had one business manager who has logged in from her kitchen. So I kid you not, the fact of the matter is, it is really easy to use. And we're gonna see how easy it is to use now because a couple of my colleagues are gonna take through some, some screenshots and show you a few little snippets as to how simple it is to get to grips with. I'm gonna hand you over now to Sam King and Stephen Cunningham, and they're going to be going through some demonstrations with some commentary for you. If you've got any questions, please feel free to use the questions tab at the bottom. Fire the questions into us and we'll do our very best to answer any questions as we go along. Alternatively, wait until the end of the presentation and if we haven't answered a question that's burning away in the forefront of your mind, feel free to email us or send us a question at the end of the presentation. Thanks very much. Hi, I'm Sam King. I'm Head of Zero for Education at Thorn Midgery. Uh, part of my role includes going up and down the country to help you guys with installation, training and support on the system. Today I'm going to show you a few key features of Xero and hopefully how it makes your lives so much easier. Hello, my name is Stefan Cunningham. I'm also part of the Xero for Education team here at Thorn Woodgery. My role usually involves giving support to academies, showing them and helping them to get the most out of their Xero software. I'll be assisting Sam here today with the presentation. Okay, so the first thing we need to do before we actually show you Xero is log into Xero. So the way we're going to do this is simply go onto Xero.com, click login, and then you're presented with the login screen. From there, we just enter our email address and our password, and we click login. Now, at this point, Xero won't let me log in because I've actually got two-step authentication on. So that means that there's two steps of security before I'm able to log in. So I'm just entering a randomly generated code that's been sent to my phone um, into here, so it should let me log in now. So I'll just sign in there. And now we're hopefully gonna go into Xero. Yep, so we're into Xero, which is obviously a good start. Um, so starting off here, before I even explain anything about the product, I just want you to, to let you know that we're going to be working in a dummy account here called Riverway Primary. We're going to keep this nice and consistent throughout the session um, and we're going to explain a few different features uh, using this one particular instance. So uh, this first little bit is all about the dashboard on Xero. Um, as you can see, this is the dashboard. So we can see that we're on the dashboard because that's the white tab at the top. So there's a few areas here that you can just see. So starting off, we've got our bank account. So important to note, Xero can have as many bank accounts as you guys want. So whether it's just your main account or if you've got a school fund account, deposit account, petty cash, credit cards, so on and so forth, Xero can accommodate those. In this instance, we've got a school current account. Within the bank account, you can see this tile. We've actually got 10 items to reconcile. So there's a direct link to the bank account from Xero, and it's putting in all the transactions that we've done since we've last been on to Xero. We can also see what the statement balance is. So we've got the statement balance here, and we've actually got the balance in Xero. So that's the items that have been reconciled. So you can just see we've got a difference between the two. Uh, moving on to the top right, we've got an account watch list. So this account's watch list, what, what this is actually doing for us is it's just identifying those accounts we've actually flagged as being our key accounts. So in this case, we've gone for the auditor's remuneration. I'm sure you guys want to keep that as low as possible. And we've actually got our teacher's basic because 
that makes up a large bulk of your expenditure and it's something you need to keep an eye on uh, whenever possible. So from here you notice it's probably a good time for me just to talk about how everything's drillable. So we can actually click into here and it's going to take us to the um, makeup of that particular number. That applies to every single thing in Xero, um, on the dashboard or anywhere where you see this little hand. That just um, shows that we can actually drill down and go a bit further into that number. Scrolling down, uh, we've got invoices owed to us. So we could just see, for example, if there's any lettings invoices that are still outstanding, we can actually click in and just see who's there. Likewise, we can actually use the new sales invoice button to actually create something on the fly straight from the dashboard. Finally, we've got the bills that we can actually pay. So this is the flip side of the income where we've actually got expenses. Uh, this will actually relate to items you need to pay, but also it will take you into the module where you can actually do your purchase ordering. Um, Stefan's going to take you through the purchase ordering next, so I won't spend too much time just talking about that. Um, very last thing on here is we can edit the dashboard. So we can actually customize this for how we want it as an individual user, not for the company, but individual users. So if you want to focus on, let's say the bills you need to pay, we'll move that one up to the top because that's the most important thing to you. So I'll just edit the dashboard and let's just drag and drop this one up. So pop that to the top. So that's just going to appear at the top when I actually save the changes. When I click save, it's going to actually do it instantly. So it just means that straight away you can see our current account's now at the bottom and the bills we need to pay are right at the top. If we go back to the top, there's this blue ribbon at the top of zero. So I'm going to just talk you through this um, just to give you an overview of exactly what's going on here. So we've got our accounts tab. This is where we actually do all our processing, be it bank rec, income, expenses, or just going down to a fixed asset register. And that will include things like automatic depreciation posting and posting things to the right funds. So assets restricted by certain funds go into the right funds straight away. Uh, we've got a reports tab. So here we've got a few reports that are inside the box. But more importantly, this is where we're going to start flexing reports and actually customizing for what we want, not for what the product gives us at the moment. So there's no sort of report writing needed. It's very straightforward. We're going to cover reporting later. And I think it's an absolutely massive feature of Zero. I'm sure you guys are going to love it. Uh, we've got the advisor tab. So on the advisor tab, we've got things like your manual journals. Um, and export, so you can always export things out of the system if needed. And we've got another key feature, which is find and recode. This is an absolute game changer. So find and recode allows us to pick up as many transactions as we want and move them into a different place. This is great for all those year end adjustments uh, that where you might have consistently posted things to the wrong place or actually for things like funds analysis. So moving things in bulk um, to allocate all your funds up. We've got a contacts tab. So uh, this is exactly what it says on the tin really. So it's just the, all the contacts within zero and we can actually drill down into any particular contacts, be it suppliers, customers, or just look at all contacts. We've got our settings. So that's the nuts and bolts behind zero. Uh, that normally gets configured for you, but it's important to note at this point that settings can be changed if you wish them to be changed. And we've got a favorite here, which is our chart of accounts. So that's one thing that you can actually have unique for your academy um, or your school. And it doesn't have to be set in stone. You can change that if you wish to change it, which is absolutely brilliant. It means that if things evolve over time, you can start adding things in. So if the school ends up having a nursery, you can add new sets of codes in for a nursery or a different cost center. So you can really start that granular reporting there. Finally, the right hand side, we've got a few shortcut areas. So uh, quite a new feature is actually our plus sign. So our plus sign, this just enables us to create lots of different things on the fly. So we can create a bill on the fly, purchase order, a journal, or actually a transfer between a couple of banks. We've got our files button. 
So files will just take us into our document storage in Xero. Uh, we're going to cover that in a lot more detail later, but on the dashboard or wherever you are in Xero, you can just click into there. Uh, we've got notifications, so Xero will actually notify you if things have changed or if there's been an update, which is absolutely brilliant. And we've got our global search. So global search, um, this is one of my favorite features because it just means that if I'm not sure where something is in Xero, I'll just search for it on the fly and then a whole host of different results will come up. Finally, we've got our question mark, which is actually all our help. So um, obviously there are support here, but there's a few different areas. So we've got the help center, which is a load of different uh, forums where everybody talks to each other, helps each other, or actually you can contact Zero Support Direct. So you can contact us direct just at the click of a button, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, that's it for the dashboard for now. Um, we're going to purchase orders next, and we're going to take you through the workflow and start looking at just a few specific areas into Zero. Hello, moving on from the dashboard, as Sam said, I'll be taking you through purchase orders. Now I've already put on a purchase order into Xero. I did that by clicking on the plus at the top right and going down to purchase orders and adding one on the fly. So to find that purchase order that is in the system, what we're gonna do, we're gonna go to accounts, down to purchases, and we'll be brought through to what I would best describe as a purchases dashboard. Now the purchases dashboard shows all purchase invoices that are either in a draft stage, awaiting approval stage, awaiting payment, and if they're overdue, and it will also show down show a purchase orders draft, awaiting approval, and approved. Because we're interested in purchase orders, what we're going to do is click on see all. And this will come through with a whole list of all of the purchase orders that have been created in Xero. Now, the one we are interested in looking at is purchase order 0020. So I'm simply going to click on it. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to options and edit, and this is going to show you a similar screen to what it would look like when you put on a purchase order yourself. So I'll take you through what I've done. We've got contact in the top left is where you type in the name of the supplier. I've typed in West Mercy Supplies because that's who we're buying goods from. Now, if this was a brand new supplier who you've never actually purchased goods from before, you can type their name in and it will create a brand new contact on the fly and it will hold it in zero. Now, the next column or field to type in is date. Now, the date is the day in which you are actually creating the purchase order. Delivery date is when you want the goods delivered by. Now, I said seven days. Now, the quick and simple way of doing this is simply just press plus seven, and it will add seven days on to the date. Order number, now this order number is carried forward. If the next one I put on will be 0021, it's automatically generated in zero. Now, I could choose the PO to be a different I, it doesn't have to be PO, I could put it SC for my initials. I could also choose the order numbers to start at 100 or 1 if you're brand new or it's, a, it's completely up to you. Reference, I've put in my initials and TW. Now the reference could be the initials of a budget holder who's purchasing the goods or it could be the departments so in maths, English, it's up to you. Moving down to the different rows of items that are going on the purchase order. First one, we've got A4 paper. Now, what's different about this from the other rows is we put on A4 paper by using an item. Now, an item in zero is a field that's been set up, which will have a description. It will have a standardized unit price, chosen account, tax rate, and you can choose what fund it goes to. Now, the benefit of this is if you're ordering a certain good quite often, such as paper, or it could be books, pens, you can set up an item for it. And all, that, all you'll have to do is type in the item number 
in this instance it's A4, and it will automatically pull through all of the fields. This will reduce purchase order inputting dramatically. Next row we've got, we've got pencils. So it's kind of straightforward. This was a raw input where I've typed in all of the different fields. Uh, and the last one, desks, simple enough. Now moving down, we've got add new line. So I could click on this and add new lines if we if we need to. You can add up to 20 at a time. I'm not going to click it because there are quite a few and it will take up the whole screen. So right down the bottom, we've got delivery address. Now from delivery address, I can click on it and I can add a new address from where I want it delivered to, a one-off, or I could search through contacts for another address. You may This may be quite important to you if you are a mat and you have different sites that you want goods delivered to. Next part, we've got attention. Now attention is who the purchase order sort of who needs to be in charge of it, when, it deli when it's delivered, who needs to be contacted. I just put my name and my contact telephone number and a little delivery instruction as to what to do when it does get delivered. Now moving right down the bottom, we've got history and notes. Now in zero, history and notes is held everywhere. It's a record of things that have been edited, approved, anything that's changed, when it's been reconciled, by who, exactly what time. Now I can click on show all and it will give me a little sort of documentation of exactly what has happened with this purchase order. So you know if if something changed and it doesn't work anymore, you can find out exactly when. It's incredibly powerful in Zero. So what we're going to do with this purchase order, now we're, we're happy with it, it's been approved. We know that by up here says approved. If it wasn't approved, it would say awaiting approval. And that's if you have levels of control, um, say if it's got to be moved up to the head, for example, if he approves all purchase orders. So in this instance, it's been approved and we're going to want to send it to the supplier. So what we're going to do, we're going to move across to send. And what this will do when we click on it is generate an email that will be sent to the supplier. So we'll click on send. And what it does is it pulls through an email address, which has been held in contacts. It will automatically pull it through. A small subject of your email, and then the text body of your email. Now this is the standardized format. This can be completely changed and formatted as to what you want it to be. Now at the bottom, you've got markers sent. Now it's very important to keep this ticked because what it will do, it will put a big green tick next to approved so you know exactly what has happened with that purchase order. You'll know that it's been sent and you don't have to send it again. So what we're going to do, we're simply going to press send. As you can see, big green tick has appeared. We know this purchase order has been sent. Now I know Sam, he's going to take you through the process of how to change a purchase order into a purchase invoice once the goods have been received and billed and how to handle that. Okay guys, so Stefan's now taking you through how to actually do the purchase order and um, just an overview of what the system's doing with approvals, so on and so forth. So now I'm going to actually take you on to what purchase invoicing looks like in Zero. So there's going to be two sort of strands to this. The first one is going to be very much a case of how to find the purchase order that Stefan's put on earlier and how to convert that into a purchase invoice. Second strand is going to be how to actually create a purchase invoice on the fly. So to start off with, we want to convert Stefan's purchase order into a purchase invoice. So we can search for Stefan's purchase order. We could go the long way around by going onto the purchases tab or we can actually use our global search. So this is where Xero is really coming into its own where we can search for anything we like. So if we search for the name of the supplier, so in this case, West Mercy Supplies, we can see it's bringing up everything that's outstanding in the system. We scroll down and we can see Stefan's purchase order. Similarly, we could also search here for the amount or for the purchase order number or invoice number. In this case, I'm just going to click onto that but one thing to note here, I'm not going to actually click onto it um, in terms of 
just outright click I'm going to open this into a new tab so I can work on a different tab and multiple tabs in one go so that would just be into the separate tab there if I just click on this tab um, just to show you what's going on with this one so what we can do here we can actually click in and we're happy that everything's now been delivered so we can just mark this as build because it is all fully build if it is partially build we can obviously mark it as partially build not a problem so i just want to mark that as build copy that to a draft bill and okay it so what this is going to do is going to pull through a few different areas so if you notice we've got west mercy supplies has been pulled through there's a little feature here to add last items. That is an absolutely brilliant feature. Um, I'm gonna come on to that later on. Um, we can obviously, the date it's referred to today's date and the due date, so that's the due date of when we actually want to pay the invoice. Stefan's already mentioned that we can put this to however many days we want. If say they've got 28 days, we just add 28 days. Reference, this should look familiar because this is, this is the same reference that Stefan used, so it's pulled that through. And then we've just got the main body. So all the work we've done in terms of the accounts, it's all pulled through for us. In this case, uh, one thing that might be missing is say a delivery charge because we can't order a delivery charge as you guys know. So we're gonna add a new line for that. So just add a line, call it delivery charge, one, uh, let's say this was £5.95 and for argument's sake let's just put this to the furniture teacher furniture and fittings because that's the largest part of it unfortunately there's VAT on that delivery charge and again we're going to use the same fund as we've used previously um, just to allocate that against the correct expenditure from there we can still go to the bottom we can either save this so save it as draft Submit it for approval, so we've got that approval process, or we can actually go through and approve it. In this case, we're just going to go through and approve it. And there we have it. So now we're on to the purchase order. Straight away, it's assuming that we want to make a payment. Um, you could actually write a check there and then if you're sort of still using checks, or if you're actually using sort of online banking, we could do a whole batch payment in one go, which we're gonna talk you through as part of our bank in about 15 minutes time. Um, also on here at the bottom, we've got history and notes. So this feature auditors absolutely love. So what this is, is there's a history of what's gone on. Stefan's alluded to it earlier, but this is what's going on with this particular bill. So we can see it's been created by me. I've actually approved it, but the key thing here is that we can see that it's been copied and there's a direct link here to the purchase order it's copied from. So it just means that you really haven't got to worry about that paper trail because there's an electronic trail which is date stamped by user and there's a direct link between the purchase order and the bill. So if we just click onto the purchase order, this then takes us back to the purchase order and we can then see if I scroll down all the history on that so we can now see that Stefan's created it approved it sent it and then it's gone on to me as a user who's actually marked it as build and then copied it to the bill so I click back onto the bill and then that's job done on that one so that's the first side of the purchase um, invoices so actually getting it from a purchase order the second thing is to actually create a purchase bill on the fly. So you might have certain items that you don't need a purchase order for, but you have an invoice or a good example might be a telephone bill. Um, so we're just going to create one on the fly here. So we're going to use our little plus again and just go new bill this time. So from, we're going to actually order some books here. Um, so we're just going to start searching for the name and just click onto the contact. Now from here, you notice this feature I said about earlier, let's add last item. So what this could be is anything that you regularly order, just add the last items and straight away it populates that whole invoice. If this time we wanted to change the amount, we simply change the amount on there um, and then we go from there. So 
we've changed the amount we'll give it a due date again again let's go 21 days this time reference that could be the invoice number um, from the supplier and then we can either give it a fund um, if we wish so we can approve that there and then and that's popped in there finally what we want to do is actually add a bit more paperwork to that individual invoice so we've got our invoice here we want to add a document so we click on the document and just upload a file so from here we're going to try and find a file so we'll just go down search for our, our folder so invoice is scanned in and then just insert the particular item we've got so i'll double click that what happens there is we've now got the file that lives directly with that individual item so we could just go in and we can see a preview of that there that means that you could be fully paperless and also if somebody has any queries about that it's there it's ready so it means that you don't have to worry about it so if i were to go to back to the dashboard quickly and then i could just search for that one there so it was uh, books are us we can see this is the invoice we've done here i'll just click onto that straight away i can see um, that there's going to be an invoice attached to it so just here we could see the purchase order any queries that could be the invoice or it could be whatever you want to attach to that it's there and then ready in there so that's pretty much a quick overview of the purchase side of things uh, the next thing we're going to go on to now is the bank so we want to actually start paying people be as efficient as possible with that Stefan's going to take you through the bank rec and also how to do these batch payments that you might do for pay runs So Sam just took us through changing a purchase order into a purchase invoice. But now you're going to be concerned with actually paying stuff off through the bank. So I'm going to take you through how you manage these in Xero. So first thing I'm going to look at is doing a pay run. So to look at all of our invoices, we're going to go to accounts and down to purchases. We're only interested right now in everything that's currently awaiting payment. So we're going to do just that and click on the awaiting payment tab. For our pay run, we're planning to pay off everything that was raised in April. So to look at that, I'm going to click on the search. We're going to choose a date range and we're going to search for everything that fell within the 1st of April and the 30th of April. We're going to click search to update. So below you can see these are all of the invoices that were raised in April and are due to be paid. To select all of these, we're going to click on the tick box in the top left. We're then going to click on batch payment. So what this does, it brings us through to a batch payment screen. So in the top left, the payment date, this is the date we want to be paid through the bank. So I'm going to choose 1st of May 2017, and we want it to go through the school current account. Below, you can add a small amount of detail if you want to hit to be on the bank statement. So I'm just going to put the April pay run. So moving down, you can see all of the invoices from April. We've got the due dates of the payment and we've got the bank account details. So we've got the sort code and account number. Now these have been pulled through directly from our contacts database held within your own zero. On the right, we've got the due amount, which is the amount on the invoice, and we've got the payment. Now zero automatically chooses to pay the invoice in full, but you may actually want to do a part payment. So for the first one here, we could change this to be £10. But to make things easier in this instance, we're going to pay everything off in full. So we'll scroll down to the bottom and we're going to click on make payments. So there we go. We know the batch payment has been created. It's currently unreconciled because we need to do that on the reconciliation screen and we've got the detail here. Now, the important thing about this is we can send remittances out and what this will do, it will send a remittance by email to each of the individual suppliers. We can also export a batch file. We've got BAX and CSV. Now by doing this, you can export it and then import it up into your bank to actually make the payment for you. 
Now we've done this batch payment, we're going to move across to the bank reconciliation. So we'll go to accounts and then bank accounts. Now the bank account that we currently have in Zero, it work. Zero uses bank feeds. So bank feeds are where Zero connects to your bank account. Examples are Lloyd's, HSBC, Barclays, a huge variety of different banks you can link up. And a bank feed is pretty much just a window where it will pull through your bank statement lines into Zero that you'll reconcile off your transactions to. Now don't worry, you can't actually spend money through your, through using your Zero. It's purely a window to see what's happening in your bank. So as we can see, we've got to reconcile 11 items. So we'll click on that, which are our 11 action points to make. So on the left hand side, we've got all of your bank statement lines. So this is what's happened in your bank. And we've got to match these across to what's happened in Zero. So the first one here, we have got a bank rule set up for EFA income. Now you can set up bank rules for things which recur quite often through the bank, such as your monthly income or wages, for example, and it makes your bank reconciliation incredibly quick and easy. To prove how easy it is, we've got EFA here. It's matched with this one here. It's saying because you've got EFA going through on the bank, it's going to be income and we just have to press OK and it's gone and reconciled. So next one here, we got Thorn Widgery, which is to do with social security. So we're going to reconcile that by pressing OK. So this one that we come down to here, we've got a discuss tab. Now the discuss tab is if you have any queries, you're not sure what's happened in the bank. You can quickly simply write in, not sure where this has come from, from Sam King. So I know Sam has had an issue wondering where this county council rates should be coded to. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go on the create tab. It's from the county council. The code is rates and why? Because it's the rates direct debit. Because of this all reconciles up, we're going to press OK and it's gone. So we're going to move through reconciling across these transactions, cleaning, cleaning. It agrees through the bank rule parent pay and parent pay. Okay. Wages. Now this hasn't had a suggestion. So we're just going to fill it out together. So who wages, what, this is the code. It's going to go to a net wages control account. And then why I'm just going to put wages and then okay. Parent pay. What, I'm going to put that to teachers basic on why parent pay. Okay. EE, so EE mobile, that's okay. ICT aid, ICT aid, it's already suggested it. Okay. Now we've come down to our April batch run. Now we've created this in zero and it's found that this amount has been paid through the bank and this amount has actually gone through the bank. So it suggested these and it's gone green. They're on the same date as well. So we're just going to press OK. Then that will reconcile off our batch payment. The second one down is the invoice we put on earlier today. So the SCTW West Mercia Supplies invoice. And as you can see, that's gone through the bank on the 2nd of June. And the invoice was raised on the 31st of May. So we're just going to reconcile that as well. So OK. So as you can see, bank reconciliation is done. It's saying great job. Now, now that we've paid off everything that's gone through the bank, the next thing to do is look at reporting on what you've actually spent, where, where all your expenditure or income's gone, how the funds work and how you can customize reports on this expenditure, which I'm sure Sam King is going to take you through next. Okay, so Stefan's taking you through the bank rec now, and hopefully we sort of showed you how to actually get the data into Xero, which is obviously pretty straightforward. But now what we want to do is actually demonstrate how easy it is to actually get that data out of Xero. So I'm going to just spend a bit of time showing you some of the reports that we've got in Xero. Okay, so I'm going to go straight into the reports. And we're just going to have a look at what Xero's got. I'm not going to go through any of these in any great depth, 
but you can see there's a lot of reports that are inside the box at the moment so all your standard accounting reports such as a trial balance general ledger reports age payables age receivables and so on now what we've actually got as well is a load of custom reports that i want to focus on so we've got these custom reports here so first one i want to show is actually a grouped period and year to date against your actuals and your budget so i'll just click onto this one Now these reports, it's important to note that they can be fully changed whatever date you want to report on. For the sake of this, I'm just going up to the end of January. So I'll just update this one. Now we can see here that we've got an income and expenditure for our school, the five months end of January, but also what we've done, we've actually got the report that's showing a month. So this is the monthly budgets for January against the monthly actuals for January. Now what, what's quite cool about this is the fact that we can actually click in and we can see what all these items are made up of. So if I just right click and open this from the new tab, we'll see that this 41,000, I think it's 41,000. Yep, 41,000, that's made up of these three separate nominal codes. So we've got the ability to actually group things together um, in the one reports, what this actually means is that when you guys actually go to zero, you don't necessarily have to change what people like governors are used to seeing. So we can actually replicate what they're used to seeing in the new reports. We find that really useful because it just means that we don't have to reinvent the wheel and actually explain to governors what all these reports mean because they've already got them. Now, what's also quite cool about this is that we can actually make our own columns so we've got the month variances in amounts and then we've got in percentages as well so a lot of you guys might be looking for i don't know five twelfths of the year down um, and that would be around 41 percent variance um, so if we look at year to date you can just see some of these figures here uh, where the variances are living really so what we can do, we can click into any of these reports and anything will show us the actuals um, and what's actually made up of those numbers. So school allocations, let's just look at that one. Open that in the new tab. And straight away, we can see what that 865,000 is made up of. Now that's not the only thing we can do here. So we can see there's ESG protection, pupil led factors and pupil premium. If we want to take that a step further, we can then drill down and we can actually look into the individual transaction. So I'll open this one in the new tab as well. And then it just shows us that this has come from a repeating transaction and we've got the line here. So we've got the pupil premium line on here right now. So we'll really be able to drill into that granular detail that I was talking about earlier, which is absolutely brilliant. And it just means that it makes life so much easier for everybody. Um, what's important about these reports is they're not actually set. And what I mean by that is that you can customize reports for when you want them. So the auditors can have a view that they have, you guys can have a different view, and they can both live in zero, and you can flip between the two easily. I'm gonna demonstrate how to do that now. So we're currently in the group period and year to date. I want to actually look at my fund analysis. So I'll go back to the reports and have a look at my custom. And I've got a fund analysis report here. So I could just click into that one. And now this report is actually showing us how individual funds are performing. So we can see that we've got restricted funds, unrestricted funds, fire doors fund, so on and so forth. So we're actually splitting this out into different funds. Now, there's a deliberate mistake here because you notice Fire Doors funds is ridiculously high at the moment. Um, what we can do is actually move wholesale whatever transactions we want in that one fund. That's by doing something called Find and Recode. So I'm just going to demonstrate how that works now. So under the Advisor tab, we've got the Find and Recode. Again, I'm going to open this in the new tab because I want to really show you what's going to happen when we change it. So we're good, just going to set a criteria. So I'll find and recode. Let's just say that the fund is 
the fire door fund at the moment and let's search for everything in the fire door fund all we need to do is select what to actually move so i'm just moving everything because i know all that should actually be in the gag so it's just a code and error that was made previously so let's let's correct it so i recode the source transactions pop the fund in to the gag review that and confirm now as soon as I click confirm, it's going away and changing all those transactions. So this out of the 102, it's changing 100 items. So what we'll end up with now, once that goes through, is a summary just saying that yes, it's been done, it's successful, which is obviously good, all the completed. We go back to this tab, just to update this. Now straight away, our fire door fund there's nothing in it because we've changed everything. We've moved it all out into a different fund. Now, I'm sure you guys are now thinking that could be very powerful for actually changing things on the fly, which that's what we use it for. Um, I'm sure you guys would use it for the exact same thing, really. <coughs> um, in terms of the reports on Zero, there's a whole host of different things you can do. Um, there's also um, this sort of whole marketplace in Zero where apps link to each other, which we talked about right at the start of the presentation. Um, I'm just going to dip into that quickly to show you some of the reports we can get out of that. So I've just gone into that here and I'll just put this into the presentation mode to make it a bit easier for you guys to see. So we can see here in our school, we're just seeing a graph format of actual versus budget. So we're literally looking month on month what's happening a visual representation which is absolutely absolutely brilliant um, especially for some analytical review that some of you guys might have to do just going to go across now so we can actually express it as a table as well so it's plugged into zero getting all the data for us but it's just in a nice nicer format really and showing us variances and it's all automated it links overnight Another thing is we can look at school, a few different schools. So if you're part of a mat, you can start benchmarking schools costs against each other. So we've just got a few different schools here. And then we can actually isolate a particular fund. So in this case, I'm isolating a fund, pupil premium. Well, I'm saying, right, tell me when I've spent the pupil premium, September and January, and when I've actually received my money. So you can see the trends uh, what's actually happening for any given fund or any given nominal code, cost center, whatever you guys want to report on. <coughs> Another one is cash flow. Cash is obviously king, so this is a good way of seeing what your closing cash position is. It's quite smart, you can uh, just drill down to different areas. So if we just want to look at closing cash for any given month, we can just do that. And this is isolating Riverway again. If we go to the next report, uh, this is actually a consolidation of four different schools. Um, so this is four different schools, part of a mat, and showing you this is a fortnightly period where you've got your sort of income, where you've got your expenses. Um, and what this is really doing is actually consolidating these reports for you. So it, so it means that you're actually consolidating things on the fly. You don't have to spend days doing things in Excel or anything like that. <coughs> Finally, we've got a report here which is just benchmarking three schools against each other. So this is KPIs. So again, getting all the data out of zero and just popping it into this application here to really benchmark. If we want to take one off, we can. So we could just compare two schools against each other. Again, it's brilliant for a mat or so on and so forth. Um, so that's all the reporting that we can do in Xero, um, just as a sort of snapshot. There's lots we can do with it. I could be here all day, but that hopefully gives you a flavour of exactly what sort of reporting we can do in Xero. Hi, it's Andy Edwards back here. Um, many thanks to Sam and Stefan for showing us some of the functionality of Xero. Uh, what we've tried to do is uh, concentrate on the key features and benefits as a uh, voted for by you really the business managers out there using the system and hopefully that's um, come across and whetted your appetite uh, i think one of the key 
features of Xero is uh, just quite how easy it is to use. And I hope you've picked up on that today. Uh, a lot of business managers, particularly those that are, have been used to using other financial software before moving over to Xero, their recollection has been that, well, the old software took quite a long time to get a grips with. There was quite a lot of training involved. With Xero, it seems much, much quicker, much more intuitive, much easier. And in fact, that argument um, also extends to head teachers. I was speaking to one head teacher who'd actually made a point of not getting involved in the financial software that his school was using before, simply because he didn't really uh, have the time, nor did he have the, uh, I suppose, the enthusiasm to get to know the software. But with Zero, he said, because it was so intuitive, because it was so easy to, to, to pick up and run with, he said, I find myself now um, able to log into Zero and uh, uh, drill into the information myself. So um, I, I don't know if that's a good thing or, or not so good thing for all you business managers out there. A head teacher drilling into the information themselves? But anyway, I'll leave you dwell on that. So ease of use is certainly one aspect that you, you love about the product. Uh, the fact that it uh, links directly to the bank, making bank reconciliation quick and easy and cutting down the risk of error, uh, that was another key point. Uh, the fact that it's cloud-based we've talked about, so you don't have to be in the building to log in. As long as you've got an internet connection, you can be at home or, as I say, on your yacht in Monte Carlo. Um, one of our business managers loves the fact that it's paperless storage because she was having to cart round reams and reams of paper in a supermarket trolley. Uh, I don't know what she was doing with it and, or where she was taking it, but even so, those are her words, not mine. And she loves the fact that it's paperless storage and, of course, you can just drill into the system and recover the documents on screen. The, um, the reporting function of Xero is liked by business managers and head teachers alike. Yes, uh, you can just have simple default, re default reports such as uh, actual against budget. Or if you've got some um, key performance indicators, KPIs that you specifically want to measure for your school, if you let us know, we can configure Xero uh, so that you can get those reports out of Xero again pretty easily, pretty seamlessly. Um, if we talk about, just remind you of the audit function, the fact that the auditor also can dial into the system and have access to the system, it means that the auditor can interrogate Xero to find out the information themselves. So in fact, they don't have to pester the business manager as much as they might otherwise pester them during the audit. And it makes the whole audit uh, quicker, easier, and, uh, and less intrusive. Uh, so um, we're already seeing that in some of the, uh, with some of the early adopters. Um, the fact that it's cloud-based and that it's automatically backed up and uh, updated regularly, it's really secure, uh, ticks another box. So you don't have to buy uh, or be committed to expensive upgrades. Um, it's all done as part of the price. Uh, they, uh, that might offer you additional peace of mind, particularly in, in wake of these recent cyber attacks that have made uh, the headlines. Um, because, uh, you know, we need to constantly be uh, on our guard against people trying to infiltrate our systems and, you know, make life difficult for us or try and install, uh, you know, extort money from us. So another uh, tick in the box there. The fact that you've got multi-user access. So, you you know, you can give a different members of the finance team uh, differing levels of authority to uh, interrogate the system or use the system. Um, so it's uh, customizable in that respect. And then if you are uh, the head of a multi or business manager of a multi-academy trust, the fact that we can do a consolidated report really quickly, really easily. I was speaking to one head teacher and, uh, you know, he was saying that it, it, it can take him or did take him up to two days to produce a consolidated report for all of the schools in his mat. Two days. And so, you know, we're saving loads and loads of time there with um, clever use of software. So... Um, as regards installation, we've been up and down the country installing Xero, and uh, it doesn't really matter whether we install it, uh, you know, mid-year or at the end of the year. Uh, you know, we've had uh, schools that have done um, both versions, and again, the feedback is the installation's gone really smoothly, and the post-installation support, you know, it, it, it really is appreciated. Um, some of you may have spotted that we haven't talked about price and might be thinking, ah, now here you go, Andy, you've set us up for the sting in the tail. Yeah, well, the fact of the matter is there is no sting in the tail. 
because in the vast majority of circumstances, and in fact, I've been yet to, I've yet to be told of one where zero has been more expensive. In the vast majority of circumstances, if not in every set of circumstances, zero has been cheaper than the incumbent software that the school was using prior to, to, to moving over to zero. So in fact, not only do we think zero is a better product, not, not only do you business managers tell us zero is a better product, but it's cheaper and saves you um, a few pounds as well. Um, and of course, in this time when school budgets are constantly under pressure and there seems to be no sign of that changing, at least in the foreseeable future, you know, that's another welcome development. And so what's the next step? Well, if you'd like to know more, if you've got unanswered questions, you know, by all means, send us an email. Uh, the details are on the screen now or pick up the phone. Give us a call. We're more than happy to talk to you. You know, you tell us what you've got in mind and we'll see whether or not we can help out there. And then, you know, if you want to know what uh, a rough idea as to how much it might cost your school, no commitment, how much it might cost your school to move over to zero, uh, we can talk through that process with you as well. So I hope that uh, today has been time well spent for you. And if this has whetted your appetite, please, please, please do talk to us. Um, we are an approachable lot and we'd love to be able to help. Um, cheers for now, and thanks for your time.